Today, I think it's estimated there's in excess of 500 billion active programmable computing devices. That's devices not necessarily with keyboards and screens, but devices with processors that run some kind of software, some kind of logic. So computers are already more plentiful than humans, apes and monkeys. At that rate of expansion by 2050, computers could outnumber insects. Okay? Now, I don't know about you, but that scares the shit out of me. <laughs> because even though the computing revolution has, has swept through the world um, to the extent that we're surrounded by devices that use computers for all sorts of things, from the, uh, the image processing and video processing capabilities of a, of a digital video camera to the, the, the phones that we carry with us, to the number of computing devices in your car, I think it's estimated that your average luxury saloon car these days has about 100 million lines of code in it. Maybe within 10 to 20 years, it could be as much as a billion lines of code running in your car. But computers will be everywhere. By the end of the century, they'll be like dust or bacteria. They'll be swimming through your bloodstream, deciding which cells to kill. Written by... <laughs> a visual basic programmer so there's a slight concern here that even though the, 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 the technological revolution has swept through the world the way that we develop software still after several decades comes down to someone typing stuff into a text editor and hoping that it works so it's not just really about whether or not we do code that's beautiful or code that we can be proud of I think actually to some extent, and I don't want to oversell our importance here, but I think civilization is basically hanging on a thread. <laughs> and we are that thread. If it doesn't work, we have a problem. And if it's hard to change, we have a problem. How many of us have worked in businesses now that are pretty much reliant on software? And how many of us have worked in businesses <laughs> from banks to supermarkets to dot-coms, where we've watched those businesses being held back by their inability to change their software. So, to some extent, the maintainability of your code is a limiting factor on an information economy. And as the years go on, our, our economy will be, our, this economy will become more and more an information economy. Information Britain or Digital Britain will rely as much on its digital engineers, which is us, as Steam Britain relied on its shipbuilders, its railway builders, its engineers. So this isn't just about um, taking pride in your work, although that's a big part of it, and that's really one of the reasons why we do it. But there's actually a lot more hanging on this than just pride in our work. There's, there's a lot of work to be done, and this is really what the call to action is. Um, it's not enough that 130 of us come together and have a loving, as we've done today, um, this needs to be spread further and wider. And we all need to do our bit to help spread it. Now, I'm, I think I'm doing my bit. I hope that many more of you are doing your bit. I know there are groups springing up. There are dojos springing up. But even if you don't want to start a group or do a dojo, screencasting. Show people what you do. Tell people about what you do. Spread the word. And hopefully, two, three, four years from now, um, software craftsmanship will not be the tiny, tiny niche that it is at the moment. Before I sign off, um, I'd like to hand over to Anthony Marcano from Riverglide, who's got something he'd like to read to us that I think, or I hope, will remind us of why we're here. Thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people say to me, what do you do? And I tell them, and they're like, oh, that's a bit boring. Obviously, no one here would agree with them on that. Um, and then they say, I say, well, I love what I do. They say, well, why? And uh, uh, Fred Brooks actually answered the question much better than I did in uh, his essay, The Tar Pit, which can be found in the Mythical Man Month, in his section, The Joys of the Craft, where he says, why is programming fun? What delights may its practitioner expect as his reward? Well, first is the sheer joy of making things. As a child delights in his mud pie, so the adult enjoys in building things, especially things of his own design. Second is the pleasure of making things that are useful to other people. 
Deep within, we want others to use our work and find it helpful. In this respect, the programming system is not essentially different from the child's first clay pencil holder for Daddy's office. Third is the fascination of fashioning complex puzzle-like objects of interlocking moving parts and watching them work in subtle cycles playing out the consequences of principles built in from the beginning. The programmed computer has all the fascination of the pinball machine or the jukebox mechanism carried to the ultimate. Fourth is the joy of always learning, which springs from the non-repeating nature of the task. In one way or another, the problem is ever new, and its solver learns something, sometimes practical, sometimes theoretical, sometimes both. Finally, there is the delight of working in such a tractable, tractable medium. The programmer, like the poet, works only slightly removed from pure thought stuff. He built his castles in the air, from air, creating by exertion of the imagination. Few media of creation are so flexible, so easy to polish and rework, and so readily capable of realising grand conceptual structures. Yet, the programme, unlike the poet's words, is real, in the sense that it moves and it works, producing visible outputs, separate from the construct itself. It prints results, it draws pictures, produces sounds, moves arms. The magic of myth and legend. The magic of myth and legend has come true in our time. One types the correct incantation on the keyboard and a display comes to life, showing things that, that were never there before. <coughs> Programming is then fun because it gratifies creative longings built deep within us and delights sensibilities we have in common with all men. And that's why I love software craftsmanship. Many thanks. That was um, hopefully a, a reminder of, of why we're here. That was Software Craftship 2010. Um, I want you to give a big round of applause, please, to our sponsors, first of all, to Riverglide, to Eden Development, to Skills Matter, and to JetBrains. So, a big round of applause, please. <laughs> Please give a big round of applause to everyone that has, has put themselves out there and, and run sessions today. They've been very, very brave. Um, so a big round of applause, please, to our, our session leaders. <laughs> and I'd like you all, please, to think tonight and when you go away, we're going to do this again. I'm pretty sure of that, hopefully here. Um, Please go away and think about what kind of session you would run. As you see, the sessions here are not really about you and how great you are, although I am brilliant, but they're mostly about the people that attend the sessions and the people who participate in the sessions, who make the sessions what they are. And we're just creating the environment for that to happen. So I'd like to give yourselves the biggest round of applause for making today um, what it's been, really, which is a big participation, a big loving. So, big round of applause to everyone. <laughs> and finally, I don't want to forget the, the people who work at Bletchley Park, many of whom are volunteers and do this as much out of love as we do what we do, probably more so. Um, they've done a fantastic job of organising this for us. Um, and um, I really want to give them a huge round of applause um, to recognise their contribution today, but also for the work that they're doing generally at Bletchley Park to remember just how important computing is to us. So, huge round of applause, please. <laughs> Now you can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs>